Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to another Keys Analysis video, where we take a look at the recent readings that we've been doing, we do some analysis, we do some summary, and we figure out what all this craziness is going on, especially with Life of Pi, because we get a lot more characterization and a lot more shenanigans. Uh, as always, feel free to subscribe if you feel like it, because I'm not going to require you guys to do that. There's no point in it. If you like the video, like it. If you don't like it, thumbs down it. I don't care. It's not going to hurt my feelings. All right. Uh, any feedback, of course, you guys are for more than welcome to give me. But yes, welcome to the new setup for uh, a keys analysis video. It's literally right over across the room from my last one. But this is way more comfortable sitting in this chair, even though it makes a noise and it's a little wobbly. But still, much more comfortable setup for me. So enough of the nonsense, enough of the crazy. Let's talk about... Life of Pi. So first off, we get to start with a little uh, author section here, where he talks about how good of a cook that uh, Pi is. It's nothing too crazy, right? Finding out that he's vegetarian and he makes really good dishes. One of my favorite parts of that particular little segment, though, is when the author tells us that uh, Pi has a cupboard that is jam-packed, literally, end-to-end, -end, with uh, different food items, foodstuffs, um, things that can be maintained and kept forever. He said he's prepared for enough food to survive the, the siege of Leningrad, or Stalingrad, I think is what it was. Uh, basically, he is so overloaded on food right now that he could survive without being able to access a store or anything like that. Clearly, Pi has had some experiences with uh, not being able to eat or not having enough food. Um, and so he stockpiles like crazy, um, just you know, for survival's sake. He keeps a lot of food in his house. After that, we are introduced to one of Pi's favorite teachers. Of course, this is my favorite section because it involves teachers and teachers are the best. Sorry about that. Anyways. Anyways, this teacher is Mr. Satish Kumar, but he is known as Mr. Kumar throughout the rest of the chapter and indeed the rest of the book. This isn't going to get confusing at all. Kumar is a very uncommon name in India. But anyways, we find out that he is a biology teacher at the school that Pai goes to. And uh, he is, in fact, uh, one of the first avowed atheists that Pai knows. He's uh, someone who does not believe in God. Not that he doubts it but that he straight up does not believe it. And we actually find out um, a little bit more about that. Apparently as a child, he had polio and he was basically uh, set to die and he was not gonna survive uh, the disease. Uh, but science, doctors, uh, they were able to cure him or at least fix him and help him uh, to the point where he could continue to lead such a successful life. And to him, uh, science and reason and, and, and medicine, these are the things that are worthwhile and important. God did not save him. Faith did not save him, science saved him. And so for him, as far as he's concerned, science is king. Reason is everything. He talks about the zoo as being uh, th this holy place for him, really, because it talks about the, you know, certain things are signs of like Darwin and, and evolution and uh, further proof to him of the greatness that is science and reason. So we're introduced really early on to a very powerful figure in Pi's life. and He's one who is not a faithful person. He's not someone that believes in religion. And we know um, in our readings of some of the previous chapters that Pi is very much a faithful person. Uh, you know, he studied religious um, religious studies in college. Granted, his other major was zoology. And he explains that Mr. Patel is the one who introduced him to, or at least inspired him to study uh, zoology. But very interesting that we have this particular character introduced to us uh, at this point in the story. Someone who's very different uh, than Pi in terms of his faith sort of things. Um, also, interesting tidbit at the end of that chapter, he says, uh, you know, I can I can uh, find atheists to be like my brothers in spirit, right? Or my brothers in faith, right? They too, just like everybody else, you know, follows along and takes steps by steps um, through our lives based on how we understand it. And then eventually, you know, just like anybody else of faith, we take that leap, that final thing of, you know, we don't really know for sure. We, we, we trust everything as we go along and eventually we just have to give ourselves over and, and, you know, see what happens basically. Agnostics, not so much. Agnostics uh, are too doubtful. So agnostics are people that aren't sure if there's a God or aren't sure if it is or not. It, they, they, they're just not enough proof. There's not enough evidence for them. Pi cannot stand agnostics and <laughs> we'll see that come up in later sections. After this, we get an interesting segment on zoos. Once again, we're into zoo land and we get some perspectives on Pi's father a little bit. We actually learn more about him. Uh, but we learn kind of how the dynamics of the zoo went a little bit and what 
uh, Pai's father felt was the most dangerous animal in the zoo. And it turns out it is, man, the people that come to visit the zoo. Uh, and Pai tells us all these stories of uh, people that came to other zoos and caused all kinds of problems. He talked about the one animal that was killed because it ate bottles of a broken beer bottle. Uh, and so it had, had internal bleeding because somebody fed it a beer bottle. Um, he talks about like people stealing animals from their zoo. Like, um, like someone that stolen a bird and they were pretty sure that they ate it or the guy that went in with a knife because he was trying to like avenge some kind of story thing like weird stuff that's going on in a zoo and it's not the animals that cause problems it's the people that cause problems which is why he has that little display thing where it's like well, come see the most dangerous animal in the world and it's just a mirror so that people can see uh that they themselves are the most dangerous animals and it makes sense people are stupid let's be honest but he also explains that the other most dangerous animal is uh i think it was animalis anthropomorphicus or something like that basically this idea that humans give these anthropomorphic characteristics to other animals and then that somehow makes them different so he gives an example he kind of talks about it a little bit where he says like this idea of giving like a, a, a an animal a voice right you know, we probably do this with our pets, right? We pretend to talk for them and things like that and, and give them our own like little cute voice for them and things like that. Forgetting that they're an animal. Now for our pets, they're domesticated, right? It's not that big of a deal, you know, to, to give them a personality and characteristics and character traits that's unique to them. It's kind of a natural thing. It's difficult though with wild animals in a zoo, especially ones that are so inherently dangerous like rhinoceros or um, giraffes or ostriches or any of those animals that are surprisingly very dangerous. Hippos come to mind as being animals that are tremendously dangerous. Um, but you know, they look so gosh darn cute, uh, that we don't really think of them as being dangerous animals. And we get this lesson that is taught to, uh, Pi and Ravi very early on where they encounter what it looks like for a lot or for a tiger to eat its prey and to actually like what, what that violence and danger looks like in a tiger. Um, it turns out that their tiger uh, had not been fed for several days just to increase its ferocity a little bit. Um, we find out that the mom um, of, of Pai and Ravi like really comforts them and is like really mad at, at Pai's father for teaching this lesson and showing through it. Um, kind of really giving that motherly sort of instinct uh, for her children, but his Father's adamant, right? He's a worrier, is what Pi said. Um, you know, he's worried that his kids are going to end up, you know, not really thinking of the animals as dangerous creatures, but as their friends and getting themselves in a bad situation. So he teaches them this lesson so that we don't have that situation. He actually goes through various other animals to show them what happens when these sort of things do occur and make sure that they know really how dangerous this situation is for them. After that, we get this like series of chapters of Pi talking about the relationship with like the zookeeper and the animals and kind of what it means to take care of these animals in this sort of way. And he gives a very detailed description of how like a lion tamer, for example, in a, uh, in a zoo or a, uh, that's the word I'm thinking of. A circus, a circus, there it is. It took us forever to get there, but I guess we got there. Um, he talks about how um, these lion tamers to, like find not necessarily like an alpha but kind of act like an alpha of their group and kind of how to read personalities almost like his father is very good at reading the personalities a little bit and kind of like figure out what's going on in the mind of an animal so as to best take care of it and in a lot of ways the lion tamer does the same thing right knowing kind of what is going on in the brain of the animal to anticipate and predict that and to make adjustments as as uh, needed. This section seems very interesting and sort of kind of random to have occur in this situation. Why do we need to know what the thought process is and the, and the ways in which a lion tamer is able to kind of, you know, become the alpha, become the main leader uh, in a pack? And trust me, this is going to be very important for us to know a little bit later on. Right after that, we actually get this little narrator section again from our author. And he talks about how Pi gets agitated whenever he's uh, saying his stories. He gets very flustered. He gets very quick. Um, he just kind of stutters on things. Uh, and it kind of happens at the end of one of the uh, zoo sort of chapter things. Um, and how it's kind of like it's his memory that does it. It's him thinking of all these things and going back into this time period. Uh, and it really starts to make him very like 
you know, agitated, sort of, and very frantic, which is kind of why the chapters get broken up a little bit, I think. Um, but it also tells us that that's a unique thing to Pi. He is a very nice man. He's calm. He's very relaxed. So for him to get so agitated and get so uh, animated when he's speaking means that there's definitely some trauma in him that's coming out now that he's going through these stories. One of the things that particularly makes him um, frustrated is he talks about this scenario of imagine you turned Tokyo, right? Huge city in Japan. You turn it upside down and you shook it. So many animals would fall out, so to speak, because animals adapt. They figure things out, okay? We could have major cities in the United States. Shoot, you could turn Flagstaff upside down. And sure enough, you find some crazy animals here. And maybe a little bit different because of how you know cold the area is. The, the temperatures are very flexible, things like that. Um, but, you know, there's this idea that like, oh, this kind of animal can't live in this area because it's just not where they're from or it's not their natural habitat. It doesn't make sense. Animals adapt, especially uh, under various and unusual circumstances. And at the end of his section, he says like they didn't think that they were going to find him in a Mexican jungle. And so that to, this is where he starts to get a little agitated, right? And he starts to kind of stutter a little bit. Like, can you imagine how bizarre that is? He's really trying to point into this idea that just because it's not where an animal is from, if an, an animal escapes, it can survive. And it can survive in a various a variety of places. He's kind of letting us know, hey, by the way, something isn't going to seem believable, but it definitely is. Right. Keep that in mind as we go through things. Another uh, narrator section or author section, I guess, that we get is a, is a detail of Pi's house. And we find out that his house is, as it's described here, his house is a temple. It is filled with holy artifacts, uh, but it is filled specifically with Christian artifacts. So crosses on the walls, a holy Bible, um, Virgin Mary's in the house. Uh, we have uh, Hindu artifacts right, that are throughout the house. Um, Ganeshas and things like that. And then we have um, Muslim artifacts or artifacts for, for those that are Islamic. Uh, they're also throughout the house. Again, driving home this idea that Pi is such a faithful individual. But again, really weird the fact that he has Christian artifacts, Muslim artifacts, and Hindu artifacts in the same household. This does not seem very realistic for someone to be so faithful that they just have all three of these. But we're going to see in these next couple chapters really just how faithful Pi is. And in fact, the, the chapter after that is how Pi is introduced to Hinduism. He goes into detail about what it is about Hinduism that he loves so much. And he talks about like the pageantry of it, the colors, the noise, the vibrancy, the spirit, everything that comes with it. And for him, that's really what Hinduism is all about. The, 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 just the faith of it all and kind of your place in the universe as far as the spirit is concerned. To him, Hindu is very straightforward. It makes total sense as far as like, it is his spiritual connection to everything, how his just spiritual world interacts with everything else. And as far as Hindu is concerned, that really shows it to him and really makes a connection to him. Um, he also talks about a woman that he knows in Canada who is also uh, Hindu and he says that uh, they, she wasn't familiar with the term Hare Krishnas, if, uh, but she confused it for hairless Christians. And Pai actually says, that's not too far off, to be completely honest. And he says it specifically here on page 50. Uh, Hindus in their capacity for love are indeed hairless Christians, just as Muslims in the way they see God in everything are bearded Hindus and Christians in their devotion to God are hat wearing Muslims. So we tend to think of these three particular faiths and religions as being so particularly foreign. But he says that in a lot of ways, they're not too dissimilar, to be completely honest. He's going to keep bringing this particular element up and, and bringing all these things together as the book continues along. So this is, again, continuing on with what we're seeing in the introduction portions of the book. More and more and more characterization and more of an insight into Pai's past when he's a child. So the scene of his father showing him uh, that really traumatic event with the tiger um, and seeing kind of the interplay too between himself and his brother as well during that instance. I think afterwards he tried to he tried to say that it was something was Ravi's fault and then Ravi like continued to rag him for it for the rest of his life, right? We see his mother supporting him and his brother um, after that traumatic event and really caring for their well-being and making sure that they're taken care of and also the fatherly support, right? Yes, it's extremely, um, you know, it's a, it's a rough situation to, to have for a kid to see such a traumatic thing, but 
For his father, it makes sense. They live in a zoo and he knows how dangerous animals are. He knows all dumb men are. <laughs> so it makes total sense for him to have to teach that lesson. And we learn more about how Pi kind of grew up. But we also start to see Pi kind of go into different tangents, right? Talking about how um, different, uh, uh, you know, animals escape zoos and where they end up, right? In different unique and special places. How lion tamers um, become like the alpha in a way of their group and, and how they can manage to get such a powerful predator like a lion um, to do what they want them to do, right? Which is really crazy to think about, but it is something that is obviously realistic. And then also um, kind of talking about even more of the, the um, sort of animal side of things um, beyond just his upbringing in the zoo. So we learn a lot about Pi in this. First off, he's extremely knowledgeable about animals from his past and also just his research and studies and things like that. It's really important to keep in mind. But he's, he's telling us about these things as if he needs to prove to us something, right? We're learning this information. There's obviously a reason that we're getting it. And in a lot of ways, it's him trying to prove to the re to the author, right? The author of the book, because that's who he's conveying this information to, but us, the reader, that it's realistic for a person to control a very dangerous predator. It's realistic for an animal to live and exist and thrive in a place that is not its familiar habitat, right? It is possible and it is certainly um, acceptable to believe that, you know, a dangerous animal can um, exhibit certain characteristics or we at least put those characteristics in another animal as dangerous as it may be So he's almost kind of like laying some foundation for us to know now Which is going to be important as we keep in mind and going through into, into part two um, That Pi is already trying to prepare us for something prepare us for some knowledge So it seems random now and in a lot of ways it is but also keep in mind this is being told from You know someone speaking to another person and relaying their story right and relaying their life's tale and this thing that's going on we don't tell things in a linear way right when we tell stories we tend to branch off and jump off into different directions and things like that right so to expect this to be linear um if we're doing it right i would say is uh unrealistic but it's interesting that we also got to start to learn and to dive into pi's faith and his religion uh, hindu is a very common religion in india but Christian and Muslim are not. And clearly he has a lot of artifacts and things that show that he also practices those faiths. To what degree? We don't know. But the next readings are going to give us some of that insight and teach us even more about Pi. But we also learned that someone that's very important to Pi and a major influence in his life is someone who eschews all religion and all faith and reason for him and science and medicine. Those are the things that are worth studying. So how is it that someone who is so religious and so faithful can see someone like a Mr. Kumar who's so very much not those things and still find some kind of admiration and love uh, for that individual and consider them one of the most important people to their life. Really unique sort of thing uh, to see from Pi here. As always, we got some discussion questions. It's going to be in a forums assignment. So let's get to it. Number one, why do you think Pi is so insistent on telling us about the animals that have escaped from other zoos and made their way into unique situations, as well as the like turning Japan upside down situation. Why does he feel like he needs to tell us that? Because he seemed like he was really insistent on it. And it was one of those frantic moments that was talked about by the author. So why, why do we get that particular bit of information from Pi? Why is he so insistent on communicating that to us? The second discussion question is, and this is a bit more abstract, but I'm asking for you guys to really think a little bit outside the box here. Why is it important for us to get the author's sections, right? We're obviously we're getting a lot of information from Pi's sections, and this is where the brunt and the bulk of our story is. But why would we even keep the author section in there, um, or their little chapters and things like that? It doesn't seem like it's adding too much to the story necessarily. Why do you think Martell chose to have something like that in this book, and why do we keep continuing to see some of those author sections? Like, I want you guys to think about that a little bit and. Kind of put yourself in Martell's position because obviously this was a choice that he made to include in his book. You guys are writing a short story where you're coming up with some of your own sort of unique sort of ways to tell that story. So why do you think Martell might have done might have done something like that? Anyways, that's it for today's video, guys. I appreciate you guys tuning in and going all the way through things. Um, I told you guys I wanted to keep doing some of these, especially with this week where I'm not doing live lessons, right? I'm in my training. Um, I can't really 
you know, I don't want to teach like an earlier class and then try to have to jump back and forth. It's just too much craziness, um, especially because a lot of my time is being taken up. So hopefully uh, you guys are getting a little bit of a break from not having to go to constant live lessons, but you're still enjoying things like these sorts of videos, which you guys had expressed uh, uh, and then, you know, you, you guys had said that you liked them. So I wanted to make sure to include one or two of those continuing uh, through this week. You'll also have some additional lessons that are going to be recorded here. They'll be a bit more traditional, but still, you'll get to hear my voice and you'll get to see my goofiness and things like that. So just want you guys to know, I appreciate all of you. Um, care deeply for you guys. Uh, next week, it's going to be nice to be able to hear y'all's voices. Uh, if you choose to speak, I know some of you guys are a bit silent. So hopefully I'll get to hear the hear you guys a little bit more and we'll have some more of that interaction stuff as we go through. Uh, before I get you guys done here, Keep in mind, your paragraph that is due on Wednesday is a proper summary. If you have any doubts as far as what I am expecting as far as the summary is concerned, go back through your summary notes, okay? Or it is graded on accuracy, not completion, okay? So you need to match that up. If you have any questions or doubts on that, reach out to me, get you guys taken care of, all right? Uh, I wish I could have had Ramona in here, but she is very much napping, and we're about to go take a walk here in a minute anyways. Uh, and I would have grabbed Richard Parker, my cat, uh, but he is also happily napping, and if I try to interrupt his nap, he will bite me. So I didn't want that to happen. <laughs> but anyways, that's it for today, guys. I appreciate y'all. Thank you guys so much for checking in. Um, I miss you guys, and I will see you guys next week when we do live lessons. But until then, take it easy.